Thank you, Lynette, and um, all those that have participated, the counselors, really appreciate all you've done this week. It's been wonderful. And um, <clears throat> this morning, we also want to, this is uh, Father's Day weekend, and so we want to recognize our fathers. You know, we um, recognize those that are living, those that uh, have passed. We have a lot of memories, and so at this time, I'd like to ask, we're going to give some gifts for the fathers. If you could stand, and uh, whoever has the uh, gifts, the, here we go. <clears throat> we have some beautiful ties to give our fathers. You could stand. I'm wearing one right now. I'm wearing one of the uh, ties. I jumped the gun a little bit. <clears throat> okay. All right. This, this past Tuesday, this past Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, was my birthday, so I, um, we went to Laguna Beach, and uh, it was a drizzle. It was just raining. It came down with a cold, so I hope you'll bear with me. All right. <clears throat> Not too many word ties nowadays, but in case a special occasion somewhere, you know, you never know. It'll come in handy. <clears throat> All right. Thank you so much. We got to get ourselves going here. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. No, yeah, I'm fine with it. Years ago, okay, I hope you wear them. <laughs> Years ago, a teacher, a teacher asked her, uh, her students, her kids, you know, what is Father's Day? She asked them, what? What is Father's Day? And the little boy in the back, a little boy in the back answered, it's, it's like Mother's Day, only the, the presents are smaller. And so, anyway, on this Father's Day Sabbath, I'd like to hide just quickly here the five R's, the five R's we find in the story of the prodigal father, the father and the prodigal son. And they are, the five R's are restlessness, the first is uh, restlessness, rebellion, repentance, reconciliation, and restoration. <clears throat> so I'd like for us to reflect on these five R's this morning. And we find the story of the um, loving father and the prodigal son, which are these uh, five um, R's. So I'm sure most of you have heard this story a number of times, but if there's one story... If there's one story in the Bible that needs to be repeated over and over again, it's this story. There are some valuable lessons here for us about <clears throat> the immense love, mercy, grace of our Heavenly Father. So um, in this story, you know, we see the love of God, His grace, His goodness shown to us who slip up, we make mistakes, we fail, we fall short. So this story has a lot to tell us this morning. And so <clears throat> the parable starts in Luke 15. And I want to begin by highlighting what prompted, what, what prompted this story to be told? Why was this story told? What prompted? And we're <clears throat> we read in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Are we glad that he welcomes sinners and has fellowship with them? Now, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so, the reason that this story was told was a response to the critical spirit of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They were criticizing because of the people that came to hear him. 
the tax collectors and sinners came to hear Jesus, and they were murmuring about the kind of people that came to listen to Jesus. So that's what prompted this story. So there were two groups of people, two groups of, in the crowd. <clears throat> One called the tax collectors and sinners, and the other the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The tax collectors, <clears throat> you know, they went there to hear Jesus, to listen to, hear, to him. Now that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they went to criticize. They went to criticize the kind of people he hung around with, he had fellowship with, the kind of people that followed him. And so um, <clears throat> that's what prompted this story to be told. And so, you know, the, they had forgotten. The, the Pharisees and teachers of the law have forgotten that every sinner, every sinner has a future. And every saint, I don't care who he is, has a past. And so Jesus tells three of the most famous stories in the Bible. <clears throat> the lost sheep, <clears throat> excuse me, the lost coin, and probably the most important one of all, the story of the prodigal son. <clears throat> now, so let's take a closer look at chapter 15, verse 11 and onward. It reads, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The parable of the prodigal son consists of two parts. The younger son, who represented the tax collectors and the sinners. The older son, who represented the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. <clears throat> In verse 12, we see that the, the father, <clears throat> verse 12, the younger son, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Here we find the first star. We're going to look at these stars. The first star is restlessness. In this parable, we encounter a young son who becomes restless <clears throat> and is yearning for independence. He has this restlessness. He wants to get out in the world. He wants to spread his wings. He wants to be out in the world. And so, in this verse 12, he must have been a teenager. He must have been around 16 to 18 years of age because in those days, people would marry around the age of 18 to 20. So, so in verse 12, the father gives, give me the share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So this boy craved freedom. I might need another. You know, um, so he has this, he had this restless feeling. You know, um, and we see this with people that have not, who leave the home, who leave um, their parents, they leave their father. Sometimes they have this restless feeling. They want to think, they think they're going to find something out there where they have the freedom and they want to start a new life, a life of their own. They want to do things. And so they have this restless feeling. And this happens quite often. People go out and, they, and they're, they're trying to find something. There's a void. There's a void in our hearts that only Jesus can fill. But people try to fill that void with other things. They try to hang out with people that are, that are not um, helpful to them. So that's what the younger son does. He wanted liberty without law and <clears throat> excuse me, a violation of the fifth commandment. I thought I'd be able to do this. <laughs> so um, it was a general custom in those days that <clears throat> the inheritance, the estate, was not divided until the parent would die, until his death. <clears throat> so what this young man was doing, asking for his part, it was a violation. I mean, this was, it was something that he was doing that was completely a rejection of his father's authority. Let's go quickly to the second or rebellion. <clears throat> not long after that, 
the youngest son got together all he had and set off for that distant country. So the prodigal son <clears throat> embarks on a journey. He indulges in recklessness and, you know, in excess and everything. There were times when it seemed that his parents, it's, there's a time when it seems that parents, and we, you know, they, um, you know, they, <clears throat> they need to permit their young, their children, their teenagers to um, <clears throat> do what they want to do, to learn by experience, to learn, you know, the, the consequences of a wrong choice, of going out and doing things, you know, it's not what parents want for their children, but sometimes, you know, natural consequences. They want to get out, and there's very much, very little a parent can do. Families face this. And so um, <clears throat> a headstrong youth, sometimes they need to allow them to go out and do things so they can find out for themselves what's, <clears throat> what's out there. Verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for that con distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Far away from his parents, far away from God, no th <clears throat> forgetfulness of God, he wanted <clears throat> God out of his mind. When the prodigal left home, I imagine <clears throat> that um, like many um, young, young people, he wanted to spread his wings. He wanted to have, you know, more, um, more of life. He wanted to enjoy life. He wanted to do so many things and um, find out by his own experience, you know, <clears throat> what life was about. Probably the only person that he cared about, the only person that he thought about was himself. So he longed, but the Bible tells us <clears throat> in verse 14, after he had spent, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. You know, when he left home, you know, and sp he spent everything. The fortune when he left home must have seemed huge. It must have seemed like he had so much. He was going to be able to do so much with it. <clears throat> you know, when a person is young, they're full of vigor, they're full of strength. Everything seems inexhaustible. But it's not like that. It's like a bank account where you can withdraw, but you can't deposit. A lot of young people go out into the world, you know, full of energy, full of strength, but they find out that it's not what they thought it was. And yet, that's what we see in this story. <clears throat> Verse 15. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that far country who sent him to, this, to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pots that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. In these verses 15 and 16, the son wanted freedom. He craved liberty without restraint, but <clears throat> we find in verse 15, we read that he was sent out to feed pigs by, <clears throat> by a Gentile, the opposite of freedom. <clears throat> The opposite of freedom, no freedom. You know, Satan deceives his followers, the people that follow him, driving them out to that far country, far from their father, far from God. You know, taking care of swine, pigs, for a Jew was the lowest work. It was the lowest work. They were unclean, and <clears throat> this young man could go no lower. Hard times forced him <clears throat> to rock bottom, but there was, <clears throat> excuse me, there was no other place for him to turn but to his father. And this takes us to the third R, repentance. The prodigal son experiences a turning point in his life. He comes to his sense, <clears throat> senses and recognizes the, <clears throat> the depth of his sin and unworthiness. Verse 17 says, When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. In verse 17, he experienced a wake-up call. 
it says he came to his senses. The phrase he came to his senses is a Hebrew expression for repentance. He began to reason how foolish he had been. And he had spent his entire inheritance in loose living, wild living, and he tarnished his father's name. He concluded that going back to his father, going back to his father was more desirable, you know, <clears throat> living as a slave at his father's home was more desirable than what he was experiencing out in that far country. For the, <clears throat> for the first time, the philosophy of his father began to make sense. So he starts a journey back home. Verses 18 and 19. I will set out and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. In these two verses here, 18 and 19, we see a genuine repentance. <clears throat> Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Notice that there's no excuses. He doesn't blame his father or the circumstances around the his home, not like King Pharaoh. You remember King Pharaoh <clears throat> who repented, but as soon as the plagues were over, he hardened his heart. No, that was not a repentance. But <clears throat> this young man, it was a true repentance. He felt sorrow. He felt bad for what he had done. And this takes us to the fourth R, and that is to reflect on reconciliation. As the prodigal son makes his way back home, he is met, he is met with an unexpected response from his father. He was expecting something different. Verse 20 and 21, <clears throat> excuse me, bear with me. <laughs> so he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. In verse 20, we see the father's love, his compassion, his mercy. He ran. It says the father ran and embraced him. Even in his condition, he most likely smelled, he smelled like the, you know, the stench of the pig pen where he, <clears throat> where he found his last job. <clears throat> Yet his father had a heart of compassion. His, he had a heart of love towards his son. The Bible says that from a distance, from a distance, his father recognized his son and ran to him. You know, we as parents, we recognize our children, something about them, the way they walk, the way they stand. And so this father recognizes his son in that condition. Verse 21, <clears throat> he expressed to his father <clears throat> his total unworthiness. The, <clears throat> the prodigal knew that there was no way that he could redeem himself. He felt unworthy. But he missed a real important point, a real important point. He felt unworthy. His father, on the other hand, considered him of great worth. And you know what? God feels that same way about us. We're a great worth to God, each one of us. So this leads us to restoration. <clears throat> Number The last R. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Verses 22 and 24, the father gives, gives him four gifts. <clears throat> the first gift, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. All the marks of the far country must be covered. He hides the rags and tattered garments of his son. He wanted to spare his son embarrassment. The majority of us here have gone to that far country. We have been there. Isaiah 53, 6 says, 
All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. <clears throat> you know, God, he wants to cover. He wants to cover the marks of the far country of those that have gone astray. He offers us, he offers each one of us his robe of righteousness because our righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags, Zechariah 3, 4. I am sure the son, the son <clears throat> wanted to apologize a thousand times over. I mean, the, the father probably listened to him only to satisfy the son's need for repentance. From there, <clears throat> the father moved on to rest <clears throat> restoration. The robe represents the robe of righteousness provided through the blood of Jesus Christ who died for our sins. It is a garment that covers each of us with the righteousness of Christ. Isaiah 61, Isaiah 61, verse 10. <clears throat> I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices with my God, for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adores his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, he adorns us with his robe of righteousness. So that <clears throat> when God looks at us, he doesn't see us, he sees Christ in our place. Hebrews 10, 17, our sins he remembers no more. That robe is a symbol of acceptance and justification, not guilty, forgiven before the Lord. <clears throat> this kind of love that we see here demonstrated by the Father, brings great acceptance. It brings healing, and it brings a renewed purpose in life. So the, <clears throat> the first thing, the first act the Father does, this loving Father, <clears throat> is to, when the prodigal, prodigal son comes back, it gives him a robe of righteousness. The second give, put a finger on his, uh, put a ring on his finger. The ring restores status as a family member. Now, in ancient, ancient times, presenting a ring to someone was a sign of affection and a symbol of wealth, of honor, of authority, of position. Pharaoh, in, in Joseph's time, <clears throat> removed his ring and put it on Joseph, on Joseph's hand, installing him in office in Egypt. Genesis 41, 41 through 43. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took the ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. <clears throat> in the parable, the father comes and takes off his ring, and he puts it on his son, saying to him, You have honor, you have authority, you have position in my household. You are not going to be a slave or a servant. You are my child. Now what does this, the ring symbolize to us? To us, it's, <clears throat> it, the ring symbolizes the honor, the authority of being a child of God. It represents the authority given through his name. It symbolizes the strength given us through the Holy Spirit to overcome temptation and sin. It symbolizes the discernment, to be able to discern, be aware of the, the deceitful schemes that the enemy employs to draw, draw us off course to that far country. <clears throat> it gives us confidence to pray prayers of faith, filled, filled prayers of faith. Okay, so it's very valuable. <clears throat> the third gift, and put sandals on his feet. The third gift, the son has given, was given. This is the one that's kind of intriguing because he received sandals for his feet. To understand the meaning of the sandals, we need to go to verse 15, where it says that the prodigal son joined himself to a citizen of that far country. <clears throat> he joined himself, that man, that he was taken into slavery. Once a slave, <clears throat> excuse me, the sandals will be taken from him to prevent him from running away. In biblical times, only servants and slaves went barefooted. 
The prodigal returned home without shoes, a sign of having become a slave. Therefore, when the father ordered shoes to be brought to him and to be put on his feet, he said for the third and final time that <clears throat> the prodigal, his son, was not to be treated as a slave or as a servant, but as a son with all the entitlements. When, <clears throat> when we are living without God, we are slaves. Why? Why are we slaves when we're living without God? Because th there really is no freedom, like we find in this story. There's no freedom <clears throat> without him, without God. Living without Christ as our Savior means that we are living under condemnation, under sin, and bring all kinds of problems on ourselves. There's <clears throat> no freedom. Let's look at John 8, 34 and 36. <clears throat> Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. In addition, <clears throat> you know, forgiveness would, would be empty without restoration. God wants to restore to the privileges forfeited by sin. He wants to restore us. You know, he loves us. <clears throat> so <clears throat> Jesus wants to, for us to be you know, his children, not to live in fear and, and in sin. I love the picture he's painting here. The shoes, with the shoes he can walk a long ways. His feet are protected. In Ephesians 6.15, it says that your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. When we have Jesus, we accept Christ, these shoes we are fitted for the gospel to feel, to preach the gospel, to pray, to share the gospel of peace. The last gift <clears throat> the loving father gave his son was, there was a feast, a celebration. <clears throat> Verses 23 and 24. Bring the, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The father wanted it to be evident to everyone that he was a member of the family with all rights and privileges. It was a welcome home celebration for the return of the son who was lost and now was found. It was a joyous occasion, a homecoming. Luke 15, 7 says, I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. <clears throat> we as Christians also confess, we confess to all by baptism our acceptance of God's gift of forgiveness and restoration. By the way, next week we have a baptism. We're going to be having a baptism, a person that's turning their life to Christ. <clears throat> so it's important to notice that in this parable, there's no words of sharp reproof, no saying, I told you so, or <clears throat> making the person feel sufficient guilt. There's no requirement of probation, no sentence of quarantine until the disease of sin has cleared away. Instead, the Father greeted him with sincere rejoicing of heart, filled with love and forgiveness. Embracing him <clears throat> with the love of a father. This parable <clears throat> of the prodigal son is a picture of you and me and God. Yes, <clears throat> it portrays the father as someone who is eagerly waiting for our sons and daughters to come home. Searching daily through the winding road to see his son and daughter come home. The scripture tells us, well, <clears throat> but while he was still long, a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him. <clears throat> so God is longing to bring the prodigals home and bestow on them and us the four gifts. 
I don't know how many. I think we all might have a son or a daughter that we would love to be here to accept Jesus Christ. They're all, and they might not be far away. They might be at home. So it could be the heart or the mind that's out in the far country. And so he longs. We, a lot of us long to have our children. Now, <clears throat> he, wants, he wants to give them the four gifts. He wants to give the robe of righteousness instead of their filthy garments, filthy rags. The ring symbolizing the authority of a child of God. The sandals and shoes, no longer slaves. No longer slaves, but sons and daughters <clears throat> restored, <clears throat> reinstated, and loved. A celebration. Joy in the Father's house. A homecoming celebration. You are an heir of God. A joint heir with Jesus Christ who has been appointed heir of all things, Romans 8, 17, and Hebrews 1, 2. In conclusion, we cannot thank our Heavenly Father enough for his mercy and his unmerited grace towards us. In the parable, only the Father could restore the Son, and God is more than willing and happy to restore those that come back to him. Yes, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> we are looking forward to that great reunion, that great celebration when Jesus comes a second time and celebrate like the father in the parable, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost and give his life a ransom for many, Luke 19.10. Yes, Jesus left heaven to come to this dark world, to come to this dark world and save us from our sin and he offers each one of us eternal life. Parents, <clears throat> how should we as parents respond to a prodigal son or daughter? <clears throat> what can we learn from this father's response? <clears throat> the intercession from a loving father. We should never stop praying for our children and letting them know it. I had a son that was left and went into the music world, traveled all over the world. I had a son that, uh, and I would let him know, I would let him know, I'm praying for you. Continue to pray for them, and they'll come home. Well, they'll, they'll be close to the Lord. And you know, we could claim the promise. If you have a daughter, if you have a son, or even a parent, whoever's out there, <clears throat> Isaiah 49, <clears throat> excuse me, 20, 49, 26. It's a beautiful promise to claim. I will save your children. I will save your grandchildren. That's a beautiful promise. And remember this, Proverbs 22, 6. <clears throat> Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. He'll come back. So we need to pray for our children. Intercede for them. Second, we can't give up. This father was a father of faith and compassion, not despair. We just cannot despair. He believed that faith-filled prayers will continuously work to remind our children of the father's love, of the parents' love, our daughters of our love. <clears throat> Remember, it is God's kindness that leads to repentance. We need to be kind, we need to be loving, we can't give up, we can't despair. We need to continue praying for them, asking God for them. And thirdly, he was a God of, <clears throat> of great love, a God of great love, patience, grace, and mercy. Parents, let us demonstrate joyful forgiveness when a prodigal son or daughter comes home. Yes, with, when they return with a repentant heart, forget the lecture, <clears throat> not the lecture. Instead, forgive, restore, and celebrate. Parents, <clears throat> if any of you here are struggling, if you're struggling with a <clears throat> prodigal son or daughter, this morning, 
We have a God that loves them. I know this is not easy, but don't give up hope. Do not give up hope. I pray that you, on the day of restoration, celebrate their homecoming. And you know what? We continue praying. Don't lose hope. It might not happen in your lifetime. My mother loved her two daughters. When we came to, into the Adventist church, our, our oldest sisters were out of the home. She prayed for them. <clears throat> and she didn't see when they returned. When we had the privilege, had the privilege of baptizing them and <clears throat> receiving Christ. So we can't give up. We continue praying. God will continue to answer our prayers. He's that kind of a God. <clears throat> so, what a wonderful day that will be, right? When we have our families with us, our children with us. Praise God, we have an amazing, amazing God that sacrificed everything for us. He, his, his grace, you know, let us have that kind of grace. Continue praying, interceding for your children. And God answers, but in his time. He knows the right time. So God bless you. So fathers, let's father, follow this example. Let's emulate the father in this parable with our, <clears throat> with our loved ones, with our children. God bless you. I made it through. <laughs>